Grand Central Murder, directed by S. Sullivan Simon and released by MGM Pictures in 1942. I'm Andrew Olson. Welcome to another classic cinema review. Grand Central Station is abuzz with evening activity. Aboard a train below the station, murder convict Turk, played by Horace McNally, is being transferred by the police when he escapes. Turk phones star actress Maida King, played by Patricia Dane, at the Harmony Theater on 43rd Street and informs her, Death and me are right around the corner. Maida, of course, panics, tells her maid to pack swiftly, then hightails it down to her fiancé's private rail car at Grand Central but not before noticing an ace of spades playing card on the floor of her dressing room, which only adds to her anxiety. As Maida leaves the theater, she is trailed by a mysterious man and woman, played by Van Heflin and Virginia Gray, respectively. Down at Grand Central Station, the manhunt for Turk is still going on, but as Police Inspector Gunther, played by Sam Levine, arrives, the manhunt turns into a murder investigation as Maida's body has just been found aboard the private rail car. Her body was found by her fiancé, David Henderson, played by Mark Daniels, and David's ex-fiancé, Constance Furness, played by Cecilia Parker. Other suspects include Maida's ex-husband, Paul Reinhardt. He works for the railroad, played by George Lynn, Chorus Girl and Midas Understudy, Baby Delroy, played by Betty Wells. Private Investigator Rocky Custer and his wife Sue Custer, played by the aforementioned Van Heflin and Virginia Gray, respectively. Midas Card Reading Spiritualist of Stepfather, Ramon, that's the way it's pronounced in the movie, so I'm going to go with it, played by Roman Bonin. Maida's maid, Pearl Delroy, played by Connie Gilchrist. Maida's producer, Frankie Ciro, played by Tom Conway. And, of course, the railroad magnet, Roger Furness, played by Samuel S. Hines. As mentioned before, the police inspector, Inspector Gunther, is played by Sam Levine. And his assistant, Detective Arthur Doolin, is played by Millard Mitchell. This movie is based on a novel by Sue McVeigh. That, uh, Sue McVeigh is a pseudonym or pen name for Elizabeth Custer Nearing. She wrote several uh, murder on the railroad sort of uh, books. The musical score was done by David Snell. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of music in the movie, but uh, what little there was fit the, uh, the film very well. For a B-movie murder mystery, this is a standout film. B-movies are typically, uh, when they started out at least, they were typically inexpensive and uh, quickly produced films. Uh, they were very often genre movies such as westerns, uh, crime, science fiction, that sort of thing. And of course, that trend has continued on throughout the decades and there are many sub-genres, I suppose, for uh, B-movies and lots of different uh, descriptions that can be given to a B-movie. But um, just because a movie is cheap and uh, quickly thrown together doesn't mean that the talent, creativity, and technique used to make the film is lacking. And this proves to be uh, proven true in this film. This is not quite a film noir picture. It's got the kind of the, the the makings of a film noir movie, but doesn't quite reach that um, style. We've got the femme fatale played by Patricia Dane, and she does a great job playing the uh, money hungry uh, femme fatale character, very deadly and uh, very attractive. And then, of course, we have the subject of crime and murder. And uh, last but not least, the lighting, especially down in the scenes underneath Grand Central Station. The shadows are, are long and the lighting is atmospheric, but it's not quite the high contrast, low-key lighting 
that you would expect from a film noir style movie. Um, you do have the the steam coming off the brake lines of the the uh, rail coaches and the locomotives. The steam is highlighted, and you get the shadows, and it's it's almost there, but not quite. The direction was very good. S. Sylvan Simon, who directed a number of pictures in this sort of uh, vein, if you will, he does a good job of keeping the uh, the cast and the story moving along with uh, his direction. He he had a I won't say he had a unique way of doing things, but uh, there were lots of B movie murder mysteries that I've seen that were just cheaply thrown together. You can tell that there's a camera filming the audio. Uh, I mean, uh, filming the, uh, the cast, and there's not a lot going on uh, in terms of emphasizing the emotion of the movie or emphasizing the clues and uh, the different characters reacting to each other. This was done fairly well in this movie. Typical of a of a murder mystery, you've got a whole gaggle of suspects, and they are all rounded up, and then the police interview them and try to figure out who done it. This is the case in this film as well. However, the the uh, the suspects, one by one, tell their story. They tell where they were. They give their alibi, and they tell history regarding their relationship to the murder victim Mida. But they not only tell it but it's shown in flashback as well. So you see what's going on with the character doing a voiceover as they tell their part of the story. So for the audience, you don't you not only hear what's going on, but you see it. And that makes it a little bit easier to follow along with all the clues. Uh, now don't, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to solve this one because, at least from an audience standpoint, because this story has lots of twists and turns We've got a whole myriad of characters who not only could have done it, but probably would have done it if they had the chance. It's only a matter of figuring out who actually done it. Um, this film, despite being a murder mystery, has lots of levity. Uh, the humor keeps the, the story flowing, and it helps keep things uh, light and any dull spots that you might end up with is just, it makes it a lot easier on the audience to watch. Anytime there was a, a lull in the action, a little bit of humor is thrown in there and just that just keeps the movie flowing evenly. Sam Levine does an excellent job of playing uh, Inspector Gunther. He played a character very similar to Inspector Gunther in two of the Thin Man films. I believe it was another Thin Man. I think that was the second one and then the fourth movie as well. The character that he played in the Thin Man movies and that he plays here is so similar. As soon as he popped on the screen for the first time during this film, I snapped my fingers. I said, holy cow, that's, that's Inspector What's-His-Name from the Thin Man. It's not. The character is different, but he plays it very, very similar. Uh, Inspector Gunther is a little bit dyspepsic, and uh, he has a few other health problems which are only mentioned and never really displayed. But he does an excellent job of playing the, uh, the perfect comedic foil to star the star of the film, Van Heflin. And Heflin, of course, plays the uh, wisecracking private investigator Rocky Custer. Uh, Heflin and Levine play off of each other and get in each other's faces in a, a uh, in a very enjoyable way. It, it, you don't see people doing humor and reacting to each other quite like this very much in in comedies anymore. You might see it in uh, comedy dramas or television to a certain degree but not quite this way. This is sort of a lost art, uh, at least in my opinion. The rest of the cast is uh, equally suited to their respective roles. The, um, as I said, the cast is fairly diverse, or at least the cast of characters. You've got everything from the Lolita of the stage to the money-hungry femme fatale 
you've got the wisecracking private investigator, and you've got the rich railroad magnet, and of course you have um, a few underhanded and less than reputable characters that uh, are thrown in there as well, uh, such as Tom Conway's character of Frankie Ciro. He's sort of a ex-mobster type who's gone into the theater business. Lots of twists and turns, lots of humor. Uh, the story is good too. I can't complain about that. I will say on a couple of notes about a few of the actors, Horace McNally, you may recognize his face in this film, but you may not recognize his name. I believe the actor changed his name sometime after this film to Stephen McNally, and that's what he was known for, I believe, throughout the rest of his career. And of course, Sam Levine, I just talked about him. He was Nathan Detroit, I believe, in the original production, the original Broadway production of Guys and Dolls, and that's for all of you theater folks out there. Uh... I really can't give this film any negative response. I suppose I might be a little bit partial to this genre of film. I do like a good murder mystery, and I especially enjoy a murder mystery with humor in it. It just makes uh, a little bit of levity is important in life, you know? But having said that, Everything else was done just as a, as you would expect from a decent 1942 murder mystery. Uh, one of the things that I did notice, however, was that, um, well, I should go into a little bit of the uh, explanation first. Grand Central Station was named because of the railroad that owned it at the time that it was built, and that was the New York Central Railroad. Um, there are real trains being used down in the the underground rail yard in the film. Most of the sources I can find online say that the film was filmed in California at one of the major studios. So, uh, presumably MGM. And there are some good action sequences with uh, the characters dodging moving trains and foot chases and so on and so forth which I found enjoyable, but the one thing I thought was missing was the fact that the New York Central Railroad is not referenced. There's no New York Central written on anything except for in one brief spot. It's only there for a couple of seconds and it's not on any of the rail stock. None of the, co the coaches or the locomotives have New York Central written on them. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say this was filmed somewhere in California and either they threw together some track and got some coaches together uh, to fake it or they found some other underground um, uh, place to do it out in California. I won't tell you where the New York Central Railroad uh, reference is in the movie. I'll, I'll let you find it. But uh, it's only there for a couple of seconds so you have to be quick. Having said that, I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give the film a 4 out of 5 star rating. I don't really see anything wrong with it. Like I said, I might be a little partial to the genre, um, but I, I thought this was a, a decent find. I hadn't seen this until recently, and uh, I was quite surprised at how good it was. So I'm going to recommend it absolutely 100%. Uh, no complaints from me. Please hit that like button if you enjoyed the review, if you found it helpful, insightful, or at the very least, entertaining in some way. Hit that subscribe button for more reviews coming in the near future. I'm Andrew Olson, and this has been a classic cinema review, and I look forward to seeing all of you next time.